Well, this is the point where ordinarily we would all be standing and applauding. And I'm truly sorry for Eric and Jordana that we can't do that for them. But please know that if we could, if we were not on Zoom, that is exactly what we would be doing. Thank you for that phenomenal performance and, uh, and just very thought provoking uh, um, presentation. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rabbi Aaron Glazer of Temple Sinai, who is going to take over for the next segment of our program. Thank you. That was remarkable. So we're going to have a chance to ask a few questions and have a conversation about what we just experienced. I'm excited to introduce our panelists. We are going to hear more from our amazing actors, from Jordana Oberman and from Eric B. Anthony. Thank you both for being here. Thank and you. And we're also going to be joined for the panel by Rabbi Hannah Orden and by Reverend Vernon Williams. So we're all together on the screen. It's good to see you all. I'm going to start with a question for our actors. If you would, uh, Eric and Jordana, just share with us a little bit about what resonated with you most about this play. That's a great question. Jordana? Oh, look at you deferring. I was going to defer to you. I I'm love a it. gentleman. I know you are. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I have to say that one of the one of the important things of being in the room working on this was, and we talked about this at the very beginning, was creating a safe enough space where we could halt when we needed to, to be able to say, hey, this feels really funky in my mouth. Mm. And when we come up against stuff. And I think the thing that resonated the most for me was honestly that dialogue, being able to be in a room and allowing this to bring us together and finding out how to validate each other's voices as mm -hmm. we were going through it. Um, there was this incredible scene where Eric plays Mama Dolly. And in the original script, it has me playing her. And we came into that part and I have to say, I just had that moment of like, <sighs> They're not my words to share. It's not my story. It's not my history. And I'm not giving her the truth she needs. And in the collaboration, Karen lovingly led us and allowed us to go ahead and flip it into Eric's voice. And the minute those words landed with him, it was like, ah, oh, now she's found her home. Now she's animated. Now we get to see her truth. And it just, it wasn't my story to tell. And I think that there's a pretty profound moment when we realize when it's time for us to shut up and it's time to hear others. That's what struck me. Thank you. So beautiful, Jordana. And what a, what a uh, beautiful um, memory from the process to bring up because that was really... Uh, a moment for me where I was like, I'm so glad I said yes to this process with you guys. Because I felt like we weren't just like, let's do a play for the people. We were we were creating something that we could be in dialogue with you guys about um, and making sure that we did honor the souls of the lives of the people that we were sharing with you. And so that 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 moment for me actually was really the moment where I was like, I'm so happy I said yes to do this because I just feel like we do have to be so aware of creating and holding space for each other, for ourselves and for others when we are in collaboration together. You can't act like that moment didn't happen and if we had just skated past it, what would have, what would, who would that have benefited, right? To And to have the conversations and so, I love how art imitates life and life imitates art because here we are. Can you hear me? Do you hear me telling my side of the story? And does it matter to you that it's my side of the story? And I just, I really, really am a big advocate for um, understanding. I think conversations have to be had because we have to understand other people's experiences and validate their experiences and not think that because the world looks how it looks for me, whatever that may be, 
doesn't mean that's how it is for everybody else. And I need to understand so that I can have compassion and empathy for other people that I'm sharing this planet with. And that, so that's really what I, I really walked away from this experience thinking about how can I open my eyes more and, and open my ears more. So I just want to say anyone who is participating, we have about 141 screens tonight, which is amazing. You're welcome to put some questions in the chat as well. I have a few that I will share uh, so that we can hear from everyone on the panel, but we are open to your questions as well. And I know the actors and also uh, Rabbi Orton and, and Reverend Williams would be happy to answer questions as well. Uh, I'm going to ask a question for our two, for my clergy colleagues. Um, the play lifts up the different ways that, uh, that Jews and Blacks view Jewish participation in the civil rights movement. Do you believe that history impacts the current relationship between Blacks and Jews? And if, in, if so, in what way does that different perspective impact where we are right now? And I'll say actually, Eric and Jordana, if you want to jump in, you're welcome to as well. Well, Hannah, I'm going to do like Eric. Uh, I'll defer to you first. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so I do think that our different views of the of the Jewish involvement in civil rights still affects our relationships today. And you see it in the play. You know, the Jews are still wanting credit for an appreciation of our role in the civil rights movement. And, you know, I often think there's a sense of resting on our laurels or, or perhaps feeling that, you know, black people aren't grateful enough for what we did. And I think that gets in the way of for Jews of being able to see the ongoing struggle for racial racial justice today, and you know sometimes I I hear people in the Jewish community saying, um, you know that you know everything was solved in the 1960s. We you know we know that that's not true, but you know even at the time, you know Dr. King and other civil rights leaders and other civil rights workers you know, understood that the ending the legal discrimination of Jim Crow was, was just one step in this struggle. And my, you know, I, I think it, it gets in the way of Jews being able to fully commit to the struggle for racial justice, um, regardless, regardless of whether, you know, we feel we've given enough, given enough credit, regardless of whether there is anti-Semitism in the black community. Of course there is, there's anti-Semitism everywhere, just like there's racism everywhere. Um, and too often I see people, Jews, using that as an excuse not to commit to, to what needs to be done now. I, I think uh, definitely that, uh, you know, the history definitely impacts how uh, Jews and, and African Americans uh, relate to one another because in the civil rights movement, uh, Jews were one of our staunchest allies uh, in the movement. Uh, and, and we, and certainly as African Americans felt that uh, given their experience uh, in the world and their work and, and uh, their subjugation and oppression uh, in Germany, that it was just a natural uh, bonding for, uh, for, the two, uh, in, uh, for the two groups. Uh, you know, I think that one of our concerns for today is uh, are Jews losing that memory of, uh, of their oppression and losing sight of, uh, of, of what, we, what we're going through here in America still today, uh, given the, the oppression that we continue to uh, uh, face uh, in, in, in an effort to be more white, uh, to, 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 to be more accepted in, uh, in America that allows them to not see what oppression really is, though they know it, though they, though they feel it. But in an effort to not, perhaps, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, to, to be the ones to be singled out, uh, believing that silence, you know, if you are silent, then perhaps you can escape what is going on versus uh, understanding that we are all tied together, as King said. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that is why uh, uh, perhaps uh, what Blacks, when we look at our Jewish brothers and sisters, I think perhaps to some degree we're more disappointed uh, in their lack of participation in the effort to bring about justice because 
of, of any one group in this country who we would expect to, to understand and feel what oppression is and what it, and what it does uh, that Jews would and would not be so eager perhaps to accept whiteness, if you will. Can I please? Yes. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Rabbi and Reverend. I, the fact, again, dialogue. I'm a strong supporter of dialogue. I think it's important for us to speak our truths and hear other people's truths. All I can think about is, you know, clearly being removed in some way from the years of the, 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 civil, the civil rights movement, right? But thinking about my relationship with Jewish people today, and so like I, I grew up in Baltimore in a black neighborhood um, and didn't really, really know white people in general until I went to middle school where I was in a, um, like a gifted and talented educational program. And my, my thought is, and I love that you said this, Reverend, that they've forgotten, they've forgotten uh, um, oppression. Because for me, Jewish people, all, all they ever remind the entire world about is the Holocaust and like how we have to remember that. And it's, if you don't speak about it, it's anti-Semitism. And, and it is interesting to think, right, you know that. That happened to you. But where are you? And, and and I'm talking about this fight today because crazy enough, if it had worked back in 1965, we wouldn't still be having the same conversations, which is so frustrating as a person who has a clear mind and can see. It's like, you guys, we didn't, it didn't, we didn't do it because we didn't follow through. And somebody from every sect has to want the change. It can't just be the people that are being victimized. It has to be everybody. And so for me, it's like uh, this, this investigation of relationship, which was new for me too, because I was thinking to myself, like, I know Jewish people, but it's funny. I, they're white to me, just like Mama Dolly said, like, because of what you said, it's easier in um, specifically in America and probably other places too, but definitely here. Let me just be white. Like I, I know people and I'm like, oh, I had no idea you were Jewish because you're not not that I don't know, because unlike me, who walks in the world and you know who I am in terms of my color of my skin, but but also me being black doesn't mean anything in terms of my religious beliefs. My like, there's so many things that that could be, but it just it does it does for me draw the question of like, what is it gonna take? And I and for me, I I I know that George Floyd was. I feel like. A martyr for the call for everybody because we all got to witness this injustice nonchalant murder for eight minutes together and of, and again here we are having the conversation like what are we gonna do because that could be anybody because if we let somebody murder people somebody on the side of the road if that can happen to me today it will happen to you tomorrow so we have to, we can't, we have to all be fighting for this together. We have to. And I think just to piggyback on that, just a, a smidge, I think what's so amazing right now is the idea of if it can happen to you, it can happen to anybody, right? That there is, there is grace in our differences. Mm. That is the thing that makes us interesting. That is the thing that we get to grow from and learn from. Fear is actually not helping anybody yeah. at this point. And if we're not willing to listen, and if we're not willing to go into the uncomfortable space of dialogue, then we're stuck. And so then what? There is no way forward if we do not get uncomfortable and if we do not listen to each other. I'm really struck also by the ways in which the play and also your comments just now, each of you, about how powerful conversation is and not just chit chat, but real conversation and not just let's have a meal together, but let's really talk about the hard stuff. Um, I think that 
we are in a moment where there is so much work to be done, but we're also in a moment where there are more people than ever who are aware of that work. And that actually feels really, I think, hopeful. Uh, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and we never had these conversations, right? So at least not in my community. So to be in a place where I am talking about it with my family and where I'm in a congregation where we're speaking of these things and where we are in a moment where not enough people, but more people are aware of the conversations that need to be had feels, feels like at least moving in the right direction. There were a few questions about the, the play itself. One uh, question about how you chose which scenes to present and how many scenes there were in the original play. And also a question just about preparing on Zoom and what changes you may have made for this moment in that regard. Do we, do we have Karen with us? No, huh? Our director? I'm here. I don't know if everybody can see me though. Yeah, we, you just popped in. Oh, hi. I can um, mind. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Maybe Rabbi Hannah can pipe in too, because all of this kind of got inspired by um, the anti-racist. Well, I'm, I actually don't know. I got told about it and I think I got told about it from our anti-racism committee and our, our synagogue, but I'm, I know that there were other levels above that and then came down to me. But um, Rabbi Hannah uh, told me about this play and then I looked at it and she looked at it and she had some suggestions, some ideas. And then I came back with some other suggestions and ideas. We both agreed that the beginning was really awesome. And it was really fun watching it and watching all the reactions of the audience because I, because I know what, you, what uh, the actors were gonna look like. I, I had it on uh, gallery view and I wanted to look at the audience, which for me as a director is always the most part, fun part of, of watching a show is to look around and be like, how's everybody reacting to this? So I was watching everybody else and while all our actors were going, can you hear me, can you hear me, can you hear me? And even, even after Eric started getting into the characters and Jordana started getting into the characters, you guys were all still going like, yeah, I can, I can hear you. <laughs> I, I can still hear you. And you're all typing in chat. Yes, yes, I can hear you. And it was perfect because it took a while for everybody to kind of be like, oh, oh, wait. Oh, you know, and that's really the reaction we wanted, we were going for. It just, this, this show just really makes you go, oh, oh, wait, oh, oh, you're talking about me or, oh, this is, it sort of just keeps you kind of going like that. So there was that part in the beginning. And then um, I really fell in love with this, this, this sort of Joel, th that, that same feeling that brings, that comes out in act two. We, we almost did in the entire act two. Uh, so you saw almost the entire part of act two. Um, I haven't really looked at the entire script in a long time because we've really been focusing on the pieces we were doing, but we picked, uh, the plays obviously, as you can see, is not like a sequential chronological regular show. It's these little scenes that are broken up and it's a play, it, it keeps going back and forth between the actors being themselves and then the actors being um, characters. Um, and so I, I was really struck by, especially the conversation between John, uh, between, um, Larry, the Jewish civil rights uh, worker, and Mama Dolly, specifically because they had switched because uh, Jordana was going to be playing Mama Dolly and Eric was going to be playing Larry. But um, it was a stretch and I knew it was going to be hard and I knew it was going to be weird and it was going to be funky. And I was like, let's see what happens. And then we had a lot of conversation about it. And then when I switched it to the way that you saw it, it, it was great and it felt good. But it was also everything that Jordana said. I'm not going to go into that. But that was one of the biggest reasons why we picked that part. And I just, I just felt that there were the the parts that we picked were conversations that we we haven't heard a lot of before. Um, a lot of the other parts of the play, they were they were definitely things that I've heard, and I was just sort of tired of. And it just sort of kind of goes in one ear out the other. And these were just ones that really kept me awake and and excited and and asked a lot of questions of us. And I knew it would be asking a lot of questions of the audience. I can pipe in also. Uh, so a Andrea Savage, who's the, the head of our anti-racism project in our congregation, um, brought the play to my attention. And uh, Karen and I went back and forth a bit. We didn't, you did, we didn't have exactly the same vision of which parts to do, but, but I think you know, that we came to, uh, you know, to an understanding that, that worked really well. I think you know, for me, I'm really glad that uh, the way that that scene worked out that you didn't um, switch the roles because um, I think that felt uncomfortable to me and I was not sure about 
about including that part. But I, I really love the beginning that that part I was sure about, you know, the, you know, especially when we're on zoom and everybody's going, can you hear me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just think that the, the message of how hard it is sometimes for us to hear each other because of our preconceptions about who the person is when they talk, when people speak in certain ways is just such an important thing to, to lift up. I also, sorry, one more thing. I also wanted, I, I felt allowed to do that because I did some research and there is the original performance on Zoom, uh, which I found, and they did that. The original creators and um, performers, they did it in those voices as well. So the, the, the white Jewish actress played Larry and the uh, black, Jew, uh, black actor played um, uh, Mama Dolly. And, and I also got a lot of inspiration from them as the original originators and the original performers in this sort of loose, casual way that they did their deliveries and they added some things and took some things out. And so that helped uh, with a bit of the inspiration as well. Thank you. The process for something coming into being is really a part of the story also. So a question, the, you know, Blacks and Jews have been allies in the past. And as we've seen through this play, and as we may know from our own lived experience, that relationship has been strained or frayed over time. And so the question is, how do we get back? Or if it wasn't as we might hope it was even then, how do we move forward in a way where we can really be allies for each other? I'm going to let Vernon Williams uh, start that one off. <laughs> Somehow I thought you were going to do that, but uh, you, you know I, I think one of the ways that, that we do that is by you know as Eric as Eric said is by conversation is by uh, building relationship through connection, and one of the ways that uh, I think kind of why uh, perhaps it is Hannah and I who are uh, the the clergy uh, panelists is because we have been working hard at trying to build a relationship relationship between our congregations. Uh, and, uh, and, and Hannah approached me uh, in terms of trying to do a, uh, a joint Seder. I said yes, had no idea what I was saying yes to, but I was really, I, I, I had no idea what a Seder was. And so I, I took a few of, uh, of our folks over to Congregation Beth Tifa and said, you know, we're, we're willing to do this, but you do realize we have absolutely no idea uh, of what goes on. And as Hannah uh, walked us through with, with her uh, uh, folks, and we realized it is a retelling of, uh, of your narrative of coming out of Egypt, of which for us, we wow, this resonates with us because of our narrative of coming out of Africa. And so uh, uh, you know, we, we, we walked through them with the, uh, the Haggadah and Hannah had asked if we could put something together. So we put a little brief history and when I say brief, probably three or four minutes uh, together. And Hannah at the end said, well, I didn't think you guys were going to be that brief. So the very next year that we decided to do the, the Seder together, we decided that we would actually come up with our own telling of the story. And so we came up with this beautiful gata that intermixes our story with uh, the Jewish story. And so we have been doing this now for, I think, I think we had, Three years or four years, uh, or, or and this this 2020 might have been the fourth year if if we had uh, been able to yeah, uh, to do it right. together. Uh, but from there, uh, you know, in, in bringing our congregations together, blossomed into a new a new project in which we call Fountain of Hope, in which we begun sharing our stories together, our personal stories together, and so we began to build relationship that connects us and brings us closer together. And I think that's one way of, uh, of bridging that gap and uh, helping each other to see that our stories really are interconnected and, uh, and that we really are, we do share a similar history. So there are pros and cons to going first or second, because if you go first and you, you know, you have to put yourself out, but then if you go second, you know, the person's already said what you're going to say. Um, but uh, so yes, I you know I agree with with Reverend Williams that um, that building relationships is important, um, and I think it's important because um, 
the more that we understand each other, you know, and I think you know this conversation tonight is, is part of that. The more that we understand each other um, and our histories and our and our current situations, um, the better allies that we can be. But I also wanted to go back to what Vernon said in, uh, in response to the, to the other question about um, you know about the civil rights movement and and Jews um, being allies coming from a place of understanding our own oppression and the way I see it is that both Jews and African Americans are groups that historically have been dehumanized and that means that for both groups um, there has been a complete disregard for our lives and the value of our lives and because of that I think there is this natural alliance between us um, that's different. And, I'm, and here I'm talking about white Jews and I wanna you know, make it very clear that not all Jews are white, but, um, but when we're talking about white European Jews, um, I think that there is a difference in our connection than, than other white people. But and then because of that, you know, I do think that many Jews feel this bond um, because we also have a history of being a persecuted minority. Um, but, you know, you see in the play that, you know, for many black people, that distinction is, doesn't make any difference. White is white. And we do have the privileges of white skin in this society. And we have to recognize that too and I, I really appreciated what Vernon said about, you know, that we've forgotten because we've, you know, we, the advantages of being white in society are tremendous. So people are, you know, understandably drawn to that. And, you know, you can hardly blame people, but in the process, I think it's true that a lot of people have forgotten uh, how much we have in common. And so, you know, we may have the history of being persecuted peoples in common, but at this point, our situations are very, very different. And black people are living with the effects of systemic racism in a way that you know, white Jews just are not. Um, so, so yeah, the relationships are important. But we also have, you know, it, I think somebody said it can't just be having dinner together. You know, we also have to do the hard work of really, you know, having these conversations and, and confronting um, not just, you know, both our, our past history, but also the situation that we're in now. And, and, and I don't think there are, you know, simple answers. I mean, I've been thinking about this for days, you know, in, pre in preparation for tonight. And I, you know, I just, I don't have any easy answers, but I think, um, you know, the, the conversation is really important and getting people to think about what, you know, what it means to be an ally. Mm -hmm. Eric. I could, I, first of all, I, yeah, dialogue is everything because they've really, brings it brings your biases to a light it brings like how where am i failing where am i failing in being like i said empathetic and compassionate to other people's struggles their experiences the life they're living how am i how can i be missing out and so one of the things that i that's that struck me that you just now said rabbi which is when i talk to people i've done a couple of like anti-black racism panels and stuff and specifically talking with theaters and people in the arts community. And, you know, one of my big things about the conversation of equality is for me, when I talk to other black people, if what, what equality looks like to you is what white people are, are having right now, then you're missing the point of what does freedom look like for people who have been marginalized and left to, to live off of the scraps of this country that we should have no poor people we should have because there if there's a billionaire in this in this world why is anybody hungry doesn't make sense but like I, that's uh, uh, I, I digress the thought of what is freedom and if it looks like what white men are fighting for right now to keep then you're wrong and you should not be wanting that thing because that means that somebody is being oppressed so that you get to 
do the things that white people are holding on tooth and nail for right now. So I just really think it's important for us to think about that. And then also, I just have to, because it popped up on the on the comments, so in having conversation, and it happened in the play, which I love, like I said, life, art, art, life, imitation of, because if we don't answer the questions for each other, right? So I love what you said, Rabbi. There are, there's no easy answer, and today is not the day where it ends. It's just not, because there are people who don't want it to end. So until everybody's mind and heart changes, it's not, it, we will be fighting. But... The, but good is prevailing, and God has already let us know that the, all the years the locusts have stolen, we will we will get back right. So I'm excited about knowing that we are fighting for a we are fighting for an end that is victorious. It's inc it's going to be incredible when we can actually walk out in the world and see just see people and not. And I love somebody said like, what are we supposed to? Am I supposed to be out here thinking like, oh well, I shouldn't care about his story unless his story is pain and hunger and greed and blah. no we should care about everybody if somebody's doing great awesome but if somebody's not let's do something about that and so i just i just think that it's important for us to hear someone said i would like to know what black leaders were doing for the jews in the 1920s and 30s during the rise of communism and nazi regimes in europe as well as the movement to free soviet jewelry in the 1970s and 80s was there black Jewish cooperation a century ago as well as more recently? Wonderful question. But answer the question about where were you guys before you throw it back at us, right? Like, let's really have a conversation, not a ducking of the issue. Question, what can Jewish people be doing to join in actively and vocally about systemic racism that has been harming black people? What is your answer? Your answer can't be, well, tell me what black people were doing. That's, that, that's not the conversation. That can't be the conversation. So let us learn from this moment because yes, all those questions should be answered, but do not please throw that as your answer to the question, what are Jewish people doing to help the plight of black people who are being shot dead in the streets as they jog down the street, jogging because he's black. I, I, I can't hear you say to me, well, what did you do for, please just answer my question and tell me that you care about my life that was taken while I was trying to jog. People, literally, black jogging. Don't ever do it because you might get shot if you run down the wrong street. being able to see a question but hear a response like that is really powerful so thank you eric one of the questions that i noticed that came up was are we supposed to see our differences or are we supposed to think of ourselves all as one people so i think curious. that, that I, I think that therein lies the fallacy what's wrong with seeing our differences right uh, uh if, if we're going to be one people uh uh even as one as one people, we are all different, but we ought to be able to see the humanity in one another. And I think that what happens is that this sense of whiteness uh, forces us both to, to lose our humanity. Our humanity is lost due to the deprivation uh, that uh, accrues to us uh, uh, by the, uh, the impingement on our, on our humanity. And those who would see themselves as white, uh, that, that is superior, that is, uh, that is dominant, end up losing their own humanity and losing their sense of, of, uh, of oneness with, with others in that they can't see others who are hurting. And so we, we all end up losing when there is this dominant view that one's got to be superior and another has to be inferior. And the problem that that ends up happening, as in Isabel Wilkinson's book, in terms of caste, is that you know if if you can't make people believe that they are inferior, then you have to then lose your humanity in debasing uh, in debasing them, and then we do things such as uh, caging children at the border, and there is no national outcry from people of faith, from faith leaders, for those from those of us who are called 
to see the humanity in everyone and to be able to actually begin to try to rationalize it. Well, they are here illegally. Well, outside of the, uh, outside of the natives, you, you know, indigenous people who were here, everyone for the most part is an immigrant. But if I'm dominant, I have the right. And then I end up using religion to bolster that. And, 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 uh, and, and we end up losing our collective humanity. And so I, and, and in that we force folks to believe you can't be different. You have to, if you're not like this, then we are going to put you in this box. So the, the let's, I mean, it is our difference that helps to propel us. And so it is, it is important to me to be able to see our differences. My wife and I are as different as, as two people can be. But when we work together and, and accept one another's difference, we can move forward together. Amen. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Rabbi Horton, you look like you're about to say something. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I wanted to, I was just, you know, listening to Vernon, but also looking in the chat and, you know, and I, I, um, someone commented on the end of the play. And that was, you know, it was something that I had, um, I had emailed Rabbi Glazer earlier today when, as I was rereading the play and thinking like, is this, you know, is this the right ending to this play? You know, it felt a little bit too much like an easy resolution. Um, so I, you know, I, I was wondering what, what other people involved um, thought about that. You know, what's interesting is I'll speak to that. Um, I One of the questions was, was it scripted or was it our own stories? And it was scripted. It was part of the play. Um, but I think here's the truth is that there's not a single one of us on this call that doesn't have that moment to speak of. Not one of us. And it is that moment where to start this work, we have to start looking at ourselves. And I feel that very deeply and very profoundly. And I think that the hardest thing to do is to look into the mirror and go, what haven't I done? What have I been missing? What did I let slide? What have I stood for and what haven't I stood for? And when I answer those questions, I go, oh gosh, there is a lot I need to work on. And that is, in my mind, where this work begins. And I think that's why I felt good about this being the ending of the play, because I think it's where we all need to start. Because until we answer those questions for ourselves, how do we ever show up for somebody else? And we have to answer honestly, not like glossy and, oh, but I donate here and look at what I'm doing here. I want to know what happens when I'm walking my dog and there's a kiddo across the way and he's wearing a hoodie, do I smile and wave? Does it depend on what time of day it is? I don't know. Those are questions I have to answer for myself. And that's the thing that I believe we need to look at. So the end of this play to me is where our call to action is, please start looking at you. Uh, someone asked to, for a reminder of what the ending of the play was, and I see that you know, some people are putting that into the chat, but basically it was that the story about the difference between heaven and hell being, you know, that in heaven they're feeding each other. And, you know, certainly it's, you know, it's a great story and it's a good message, you know, that we need to work together and help each other, but um, don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's enough. And, um, and you know, there were also some comments in, in the chat about the ways that, you know, we are purposely divided. And I think that's also important to, you know, to talk about that that is the history of oppressed people. Um, you know, the people in power find ways to divide us. If we weren't divided, people in power wouldn't be able to stay in power. Yeah, one of the questions I saw was how do we actually start this work when we don't live together, when our neighborhoods are segregated, when we don't all know people who are that different from who we are? How do we actually be, as Brian Stevenson says, in proximity? How do we do that? 
I think part of, you know, one of the things I just moved to this area in July and have become involved in the Summit Interfaith Council, and it's something that does not exist in enough places. Rabbi Friedman just put the dialogue circles in the chat. Um, you know, the Summit Interfaith Council is a group of clergy from lots of different backgrounds in one town saying we are going to talk to each other and we are going to make this effort and and people are joining and and having those conversations. So it's hard and it's it's not um, it's not something that happens without putting in the effort, without showing up, without looking for each other. And, and I think, Rabbi, you know, it 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 also um, is just a matter of start. Uh, be intentional about starting. Everyone wants to know well, where do I start? Well, where can you start? S start where you are. Everyone wants to be able to do the big thing, and it is not the big thing that moves this 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 effort forward. It's the everyday little things that if we if we are just intentional, intentional about say, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a, a, a presumption about who this individual is. Perhaps I'll just speak. Let me, let, let me just do that uh, versus they're not going to like me or, or what have you. Uh, you don't know what is going to happen if you, if you don't start. And, and if we always keep asking, where do I start? No one starts and we all stay separate. Uh, but it is the intentional of uh, coming together, the intention of trying to reach out to, to one another, that is the is the start of it. And and to, to be able to look at it as we're going to be start and stopping often, but to have the resilience, the 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 dedication to stay in it, because a racist system and structure is resilient. When it is put down, it just morphs. It is worse than the coronavirus because it will it will uh, create a new variant and and look for new hosts. And and as long as the the hosts are, are receptive, it, it it just starts. It just tries to populate. So why don't we just continue? Why don't we just be intentional and just begin to be to to just talk to one another? Thank you. So I'm gonna close with a question for all of the people who joined tonight and something for all of us to take away from this. There's probably more than one question that we're all left with after something as powerful as the conversation that we've just had, but here's one for us to each take away. We all have stories that we tell ourselves about our own history, about who we are, about who others are. And so the question is, how was watching the play? How has that helped you recognize some of your own preconceptions? This is what we've been talking about and what we've been hearing on the panel, reflecting ourselves on who we are and what we assume and thinking about what this play has brought up for us. And then also, what can you take away from this experience that will help you see yourself and others more clearly? How can the conversation and the play and the, the words and the scenes help us see ourselves and see others more clearly. So with that, I just want again to thank Rabbi Orton and, Ra and Reverend Williams and our two actors, Eric and Jordana, and I'm gonna turn it over to Rabbi Orton for a few closing words. Thank you. Thank you so much for your facilitating it, Erin. And before we conclude, I want to put on my hat as the president of the Summit Interfaith Council and there were a couple of comments about the dialogue circles on race that the Interfaith Council's Anti-Racism Committee has been doing for the last five years. I think we've had over 500 people participate. And um, you know, if, if people are talking about proximity and talking about opportunities to um, have these conversations to learn more about racism, you know, there, we, we have that opportunity here in Summit and surrounding towns. So um, I hope somebody will put the, the link back into the chat and um, there, it's a link to a form to sign up if you are interested. We're starting a new round in March. And, um, and if you, you know, fill out that form, then you'll get information when, when, the, when the dialogue circles begin. We have, um, two sets. We have a, a dialogue circles 1.0 and 2.0, so uh, to take a deeper dive. And in addition to that, 
Um, Oh, yeah, I just also just wanted to say that the, the dialogue circles are, are five weeks and they are facilitated by trained facilitators. Uh, and, you know, people do often say that we don't have opportunities to, you know, to have these conversations. So um, take advantage of it. And then tomorrow is our holiday in, in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, the Summit Interfaith Council has planned a car procession for tomorrow. and. The idea came up because um, this year, everything is on Zoom, online, and we wanted to have an opportunity to at least see each other, even if we're in our cars, you know, to have that sense of community and that sense that there are, we're not alone. <laughs> there are a lot of people, you know, who are engaged in this, in this struggle. And, um, and it's going to be, it's going to start at Summit High School parking lot we're asking people to arrive between 2 and 2.15 and the program will begin with a, um, an online 15 minute introduction uh, that will be on the Summit Interfaith Council Facebook page and then we will set out on our procession when we'll go past most of the houses of worship in Summit. And what we've designed is a theme of racial justice then and now. So we'll, the, the displays will alternate between quotes from Dr. King with, um, photos from the civil rights movement alternating with action steps that we can take to increase racial justice today. So I hope that you will um, try to come. And, and, there, and then of course, there's the annual Martin Luther King Day service at Fountain Baptist Church at 7 p.m. tomorrow that will be live streamed. So, um, so finally, I want to, uh, Thank everybody. I want to first of all thank our actors, Eric Anthony and Jordana Oberman. Um, fantastic performance. I mean, I read the play several times, but you brought it to life in such a powerful way. And of course, uh, Beth Hatikva member Karen Summers Cooper for for uh, directing the play um, and also for her enthusiasm for this project. I was wavering about whether to go forward and she was you know adamant <laughs> that we should do it and i she was right it was good so in our pandemic world we cannot function without a tech team so we want to give many thanks to rabbi friedman philip Cantor, and david silberman for making sure that everything went incredibly smoothly on zoom tonight and this evening, as Rabbi Friedman said, was sponsored by the Three Summit Synagogues. And um, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure over the past few years you know, to work for us to work together. Uh, sometimes differences even within Judaism can, can uh, get in our way. And uh, I felt you know, proud of the ways that we have worked together. And so um, finally, I want to give a special shout out to Andrea Savage and the Anti-Racism Project at Congregation Beth Atikva, who, who took care of all of the details uh, that made this evening possible. And, and thank you all for coming and for you know, being willing to have this conversation. Good night.